time. He's actually here today. He's with us, and he's going to be ministering and sharing with us today. Now listen. Oh, uh-uh, wait, wait. Brother Sappho, don't go nowhere yet. Brother Sappho, don't go nowhere yet. Yeah, don't go nowhere yet. Because Pastor Peter likes to preach in A-flat. Now, don't tune him up yet. Wait till you get up here. Just wait just a minute. Do you ever have friends who God puts you in contact with and, and, and um, you see each other, you're not sure why God's putting you together, then as time unfolds, you just realize you really are better together? I stumbled on this friend a long time ago. Now, he's, he's, he's got a lot of great qualities, so he stands out for a number of reasons. But uh, if you watch my, my um, video, Skydiving, this is the buddy that I jumped out the plane with. And uh, so I went first. He went second. And, um, and yeah, so we were, trying to, we were trying to represent very well. And I was the only brother on the, on, the, on, the, on the plane in the crew, so I wanted to make black folks look good. And so, <laughs> but we met at a conference. We just did a bunch of crazy things together. We went stock car racing, paintballing, then we jumped out of a plane together. And you know who your real friends are when you jump out of a plane. These are the last people you see before you jump. <laughs> And I didn't have, you know, and I didn't have permission because they didn't give us time to call our wives. So we really, they, they, this isn't good pastoral practice, but a group of pastors, we just snuck out. They didn't tell us what we were going to do. Got us up in the plane. Said, no, 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 you don't have to just put the uniform on. We just want to take you through an experience. No, no, just go through the lesson. No, just sign the paperwork. <laughs> they made us look at, at a 20-minute video with this old hippie-looking attorney sitting behind a wood desk saying, you know, in the unlikely event of your untimely death, you, can, we, you hereby indemnify this organization here, and you can't be suing us nor any heirs of your estate. So I'm thinking, is this stuff real? And so we really connected because I got down on my knees and just started praying out loud, and I started saying words that I learned from some of my Korean brothers. Well, they weren't Christian words. <laughs> you know, you hang around people, so you learn stuff. You know, I'm a, I'm a student. And so I got the attention of the Korean brothers in the room. They're like, who is that over there cussing like that? And I, didn't know, I was just saying some stuff. I just, my English wasn't sufficient. I was scared. <laughs> Listen, he forgave me. I landed. Listen, if I had died, then I would have known he hadn't forgiven me. <laughs> but just in jumping together, I'm just telling you, God has really knit my heart. With Peter. When, when I talk about not being here and being in New York, this is the brother that I'm hanging with. And when I'm ministering at his church, and his family and his church feels like family to me. When I'm in, when I'm in the New York area, I'm staying with his family. Um, I've convinced his son that he's my twin, um, <laughs> that we look exactly alike, and people can't tell us apart in the playground. And so um, he's going to probably need some counseling later. Or just don't tell him. Just don't tell him. <laughs> when I went to Africa a few years ago, um, it was Pastor Peter that invited me, and not knowing that it was really a longing in my heart to want to go to the motherland. And he invited me not only once, but twice. But it was really interesting that I went to Korea for the first time, and he hadn't really been in, what, like 13, in many years. And so he encouraged me to go to Africa, but I'm the one who said, I want you to go to Korea with me. And I said, this is interesting that you encouraged me to go to Africa, so you came to, with me to my motherland. I want to I experience Korea with you. And so we got a chance to hang out there. So it's just interesting how God puts people in your lives to take you in unique places. And so he introduced me to Africa, but I introduced him to Ambassador Kim, who's one of the ambassadors from Korea to, to, um, to New York. He was, a, he was an associate of mine, and we were touring his office this day. But we made a pact. Um, we were on our way to South Africa the last time, and we stopped in um, Dubai. And we made this pact. We said, we are going to travel the world together preaching on all the continents. We're going to travel. We're going to see the seas. We're going to see the nations. But we made a pact as friends that we're going to really, we're going to really, um, we're going to really just serve God and preach. I just one quick Pastor Peter story. We were staying at this house in, um, in South Africa. And the host, and there's still some tension, you know, between Africans and Afrikaners and stuff like this. And so, so I'm staying at this house with this gentleman who, who used to, he's a Dutch guy who used to hire the Africans to work. So there was just still some, t- there was some stuff there. And so he was used to people who look like me working for him. And he wasn't used to people who look, look like me who could be his instructor or his college professor. So he would make some comments and I would make some comments and he would make some comments and I would make some comments. But you know what? I realized I was like 2,000 miles from home and I was in his house. <laughs> so at some point I just excused myself from the party and went inside because, you know, I didn't want to start doing some stuff in English that I had done in Korean. And so, so I walked inside, 
And so Peter came and said, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, man, that man's talking ignorant out there. And he's, you know, he's talking about, he's talking about my people. You know, I know him from across the pond, but still. And so Peter said, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. And so, <laughs> so we went outside and people went, because he could tell I was messed up. This brother pressed in, started praying in some heavenly language. said, okay, wait a minute. This is my brother now. He knows how to warfare, so we're going to go in and talk to God for real. But that night, he said, Alex, I thought Max was going to come and kill you. And I said, he said, so I left my door open so I could hear if you started hollering. I said, you just said black Korean relations. Back to South Central LA. As big as you are, you're going to open your door so you can hear if he's killing me down here. You better come downstairs and help me take Max out. Because you're from Korea, so I know you can fight. So we had some laughs. Those are the only ones I can tell you about. There's a whole bunch of others that he'd have to shoot me if I told you. But listen, listen, listen. When you meet people that your hearts connect with and that God connects you with, hold to them. Keep in touch with them because this is really, really a brother that God has given me. I enjoy being around him. Um, uh, I meet pastors and friends all the time. This is one of my closest brothers. I can talk to him about family stuff, about ministry stuff, and we can encourage each other. So it's really, really wonderful to, uh, to be able to, to, um, to, to have him here. And so, you know, he's never really had like, like an organ chord. I'm messing with him. He's not going to really do that. But just kind of put him in A flat for just a minute. So, so you all, I want you to ready your hearts all the way from Inglewood, New Jersey, the lead and founding pastor of Metro Community Church by way of South and North Korea, Pastor Peter Ron, put your hands together. All right, what's up, Fountain of Life? Praise God, it is great to be here. And that picture, Alex, you and I were about 35 pounds heavier. And we've lost weight together, and it's a, it's a brotherhood for life. Um, man, it is so good to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. And I don't know, I just feel like I don't, we, 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 I don't really need to preach because uh, I've been so blessed, and I know you have been, through the worship, through the children, through everything here. So thank you for leading us in a, in a powerful time of worship. I was here last year around this time, and uh, we were at the Boys and Girls Club. And I remember giving you guys a word. I don't know if you remember this. And Alex keeps reminding me, so I'm very thankful about it. But I said to him, I said, and I said to all of you that Sunday, I said, I really feel like this church is standing on fertile ground. You guys remember that? But, man, y'all took that to a whole nother level. <laughs> I mean, look at this place. Alex gave me the tour of, uh, of this extension and what God is doing here. Visit the Nehemiah house and and seeing what the Lord is doing here, it is absolutely amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And so I have another word for you. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. All right. So the other word I feel like God wants you to receive is this, that he's going to use the faith of this church to humble many Christian leaders. And it's not necessarily to make them feel bad, but what it's going to do, it's going to humble them, and it's going to allow them to experience a little bit of spiritual envy. And they're going to want to have the kind of faith that you have. And I hope that all of you will come together and will continue to live your life faithfully like that. I experienced that yesterday as I was here when a couple of the men got together and we prayed. And I just thought, wow, I had spiritual envy. Because some of the men in this church, the faith that they have and the faith that they walk with is absolutely amazing. Amazing. It really is. And so I'm looking forward to coming back next year when everything is built up and uh, celebrating with you together uh, what God is doing here. So may you continue to be a city set on a hill for the Lord. And so what I want to do today is I want to share with you a little bit about waiting. I want to share with you the truth about waiting. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like to wait. If I'm at a restaurant and it takes long to bring out the food, I get a little upset. Uh, I know maybe you don't like to wait. 
And, and sort of we live in a day and age with all this technology advancements uh, that we live in today that we don't like to wait. You have phones where you can access your entire life. You can access things at cr incredible speeds, can't you? The whole 4G LTE, I hear it's faster than the cable modem that we have at home. That's how fast. That's how fast we like to live in. We don't like to wait, do we? It's not a thing that uh, you and I embrace very much. And, uh, and when you look at even companies uh, that do customer service, their entire goal is to make sure that they don't allow their customers to wait. And waiting sometimes, we look at it in our culture, it's very negative, isn't it? Because if you have to wait, there's always some negativity associated with it. But do you know that waiting is a spiritual discipline? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? And if patience is a fruit of the Spirit, then waiting is a spiritual discipline. And many times when God makes us wait, do you ever feel like God makes you wait sometimes? You ever experience that? And you wonder, God, why are you making me wait? And many times you get a little upset about God because, again, waiting is associated as being very negative in our culture today. And so we bring that into our spiritual lives, and when we wait, and when we feel that God is making us wait, we think perhaps maybe we did something wrong because God's not answering our prayer, or we think perhaps, you know, maybe God is angry with us, and we wonder why God is making us wait. I want to talk to you about the depth and the spiritual truth and the spiritual sort of openness that God wants to do in your life as he may be calling some of you to wait. If you feel like you're waiting today, because some of you are, perhaps you've been waiting for a long time. Some of you are waiting to get married. You never thought you'd be at this stage of your life today and still be single. And you're waiting to get married. Some of you are waiting to get a job or you're waiting to get a promotion. You're waiting and you're hoping that God would help you to get out of the red every month that you live in perhaps. And so you're waiting. And those are all important things that you want God to act upon in your life. And there's some of you in this room, you're waiting for God to desperately heal you of a wound that you have experienced in your life that you carry today and you still lick those wounds and they're still very fresh in your life. And you're wondering, God, when are you going to finally heal me? When? And you're waiting upon God. Well, today what I want to do is I want to look at Jesus Christ, sort of in the last few hours of his life. And we're going to look at a very powerful passage of Scripture where he waits. And in this story, he's going to teach you and I how we can get to a place in our own lives where we can allow our faith to go deeper in God as we wait for him. It's a beautiful place to be if God is calling you to wait today, if he's waiting and he's expecting you to wait upon him. And I want to share with you this passage. Jesus, in this last few hours of his life, is waiting to die. That's pretty hard when you're waiting to die. But there are a few other things that he's waiting for that God sort of puts him through. And in that process, he's going to teach you and I how we can experience deeper where we are in our position that God has created before us through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We are God's beloved in whom he is well pleased with. And he's going to teach us powerfully how you and I can wait upon the Lord in a way where we can grow closer to him. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. I want to take you to verse 27. Now, when you look at the passion narratives, what you find is that Jesus, you see so much more of his humanity than you do his divinity. It's a beautiful thing. And so what you're finding here is you're just looking at a Jesus, and this is actually a critical phase and for Jesus to be at this place, but he is worried. He's going through a lot. His heart is extremely heavy. Look what he says in verse 27 as he's, as he's with his disciples in the upper room. He says, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he, began to and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. 
Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared with him, was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayers had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away on the guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed them. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. This is the word of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. God, help us to grapple with this text. So many times we want to see a Jesus that is infinitely powerful, that is overcoming everything and even in his own life. And yet we see a Jesus here that's extremely vulnerable. Help us to grapple with this text, God, and I pray that it would teach us deeply more and more, God, how when we wait, while you make us wait, God, that we could really experience the depth of who we truly are before you, a beloved child of God. And so, Lord, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts in this room today would be pleasing unto you. So it's in your name that we pray. Amen. And so when you look at this passage, Jesus, the, really the focus here is Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when you look at this passage, you'll find that Jesus is really in a very tough place in his life. And it's easy for us to assume when we look at this passage that Jesus is struggling because he's waiting to die. And if you and I knew that we were going to die in several hours, I think we'd struggle a little bit, wouldn't you? We would struggle, we would go, we would have grief, we would be overwhelmed with the reality of what is going to happen to us. Jesus is God, but he's also man. He's also human. He did not want to die. He goes to God and he says, if this cup can pass, please take it away from me. But not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is waiting to die, but he's not only waiting to die. You know what else he's waiting for? He's waiting for Judas to betray him. You see, Jesus gave three and a half years of his life to these disciples. He poured his whole heart into the lives of these men. He loved them with all of his heart. And now he has to wait for one of them to betray him with a kiss. That is deep and that is painful. The level of rejection, the level of unfaithfulness that he was now to experience with Judas is something he had to deal with emotionally. Would abandon and flee, one, but he had to deal with the reality of him. But so many times, like Peter, how many times do we struggle and we fall back to our old self? It happens all the time, doesn't it? And we see that happening with Peter, that Peter goes back to his old self, and Jesus calls him by his old name, Simon, why have you fallen asleep? Are your eyes really that heavy? Jesus goes back, and he prays more. And he cries, and in Hebrews 5, 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus prayed that the cup would be taken away. I love this. It says that he was heard, but yet he wasn't because he, had a, he was at a place where God still said, I ain't going to take this cup away from you. You still have to go through this death. And he submitted himself to God's will. You see, waiting is a spiritual discipline. See, this part in Gethsemane, once you, after Gethsemane, Jesus is very different. He's a new creation. 
he experiences something very deep in God. And I'm going to talk about that. But why would God make you wait? Why? Why does God make you wait? Because some of you have very important things that need to happen in your life today. Why would God make you wait? It almost seems kind of wrong that God would make you and I wait. Doesn't it? Why would God make you wait? Why would God make me wait? One thing is so that you can truly learn to depend upon him. There are so many things in this world, my brothers and sisters, that compete for your trust. So many things. Of course, there's technology. There's different people that some of you trust in. You. Sometimes we trust in ourselves too much. There's so many things. And when you have nothing, when God strips all of that away and all you have is Jesus Christ, it is one of the most difficult places to be, but it is one of the most beautiful places to be in. I call that the spiritual sweet spot. When you have nothing else left but Jesus, none of you, if you're really honest, like to be in this position. When you have nothing else but Jesus, and that's all you have, it is a scary place to be, but it's actually one of the best places where you can be. That's exactly where God wants you today. And that's why he makes you wait. Because he wants to remove these things that you're placing a lot of trust in and so that you can go to him again and realize that you are all I have, Jesus. That's what he wants from you, and that's what he wants from me. So when I got married, I got married about 13 years ago. I was working in the marketplace before I felt a very deep calling to go into ministry. And uh, my wife and I started to really fight about that. And there was a point where my wife wasn't very supportive of me going into ministry. And then finally, after working with her for a few months after we got married, she said, okay, I'll support you. But I'm not going to move because I wanted to move to California and go for some training in seminary uh, 3,000 miles away because I lived in New Jersey. And she did not want to go that far because she loved being near her family. And I said to her, I said, I really feel that God is calling us across the other side of the state, uh, other side of the country so that we can be together and not be around family. And she wouldn't go for that. And I tried. Guys, you ever try to convince your woman? about something and they're just not budging. You know they're not going to budge. I tried everything and it didn't work. We fought so much in the beginning of our marriage. I mean, I tried everything. I even, I even used the Bible to try to manipulate the situation. You ever use the Bible to try to twist a situation? I opened up Ephesians 5 and I said, hey, honey, you're not going to believe this, but it says that uh, the wife should submit to the authority of her husband. <laughs> and she said, man, you can't make me do what I don't want to do. She was absolutely right. You see, many, many of us guys, we forget that passage, don't we? Because we love looking at 522, don't we? But we forget to look at 23 and 24, because what does that say? It says, husbands, submit to your wives. Love your wives the way Christ loved the church. And guys, how did Christ love the church? He died for the church. So get the picture. Husbands, you have to die to your wives. Wives, you just have to submit to your husband. That's a whole different level, isn't it? But I didn't want to look at the 23 and 24. I just want to look at 22 and say, honey, you got to submit to my authority, right? And I tried everything. And there was a dark night in uh, 2000 of February where it was one of those nights because I really felt this was a calling and we needed to move across. And uh, I knew she wasn't budging. And so I remember I couldn't sleep. So I just got out and I went to the living room and I just knelt before God. It was late. It was probably past midnight. And I just started breaking down before God. And I said, what's going on? Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? It's like, God, why doesn't my wife see what you and I see? Why is this so difficult? And in that moment, God said to me, he said, Peter, do you trust me? I said, sure, I trust you. Of course I trust you, God. I trust you with all my heart. And he says, then I want you to release this burden from your wife, and I want you to give her the power to make this decision without your input. I said, no. I said, if I do that, she's going to say no. I was like, I can't do that. And that whole evening, he said, Peter, do you trust me? I said, God, you know if I do that, she's going to say no. I can't give her the authority to make this decision without my input. And that whole night, he kept saying, well, Peter, do you trust me? And to my shame that night, I said, no, I don't. Because I know that if I do this, she's going to say no. I know my wife, very stubborn woman. 
And so for the next month, I just tried to convince her and fight with her. It was a very hard month. And then finally got to the point where I said, all right, God, I'm going to trust in you. And so I go up to her and I say, hey, I'm sorry for making your life very difficult over the last several months. And I just want you to know that uh, I'm going to give you the power to make this decision. Whatever you say, I'm going to do. And she looked at me and she goes, well, you know it's a no then. And I said, well, can you just do me a favor? In 30 days, could you just pray for the next month? And after that month, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And she looked at me and said, okay. And I'll, she said, I'm going to say no, though. You know that. I said, well, if you do in 30 days, I'll, I'll stay. And in those 30 days, I didn't mention because I knew I, I couldn't mention California and Fuller and all these different things. And, you know, I tried to do things subliminally. I, I, you know, we watched like Beverly Hills Cop and different things like that, <laughs> hoping that she'd be like, wow, Callie is nice, you know. And, and, I, and I was hoping that she'd pray some more. I'm like, why isn't she praying more? She should be praying, hearing from God. And, and I didn't feel like she was doing that. Like, you know, I'd kind of nudge her in the morning, try to wake her up a little bit earlier so she could pray a little bit so God could speak to her. Nothing of that nature. And so I knew and I was convinced that there was no way she was going to say yes. And after 30 days, after we had that talk, and I said, what are you going to decide? She said, God spoke to me. Let's move to California. You see, God wanted me to get out of the way so that he could work. I was trusting too much in my own strength, and he wanted me to get away so that he can do the real work. And I still believe to this day it's one of the greatest miracles I experienced in my life, that he changed her heart like that. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, it's not easy when God strips everything away and all you have is Jesus left in your life. It is a hard place to be, but it's the best place to be because that's when you see God part the Red Sea. That's when you see God do things where he can literally move the mountains. So while you're waiting... Know that God is wanting to filter things out of your life so that you can trust deeply in your God. And know that as long as you have Jesus, you have everything you need. Amen? Amen. So how do we do this, though? What is one of the key things that Jesus did at the garden that you and I need to learn to do? The one thing is this. It's prayer, but not just prayer, but it's prayer of lament. Prayer of lament, that we need to get to the point in our lives where we have such a deep, intimate walk with the Lord, where we are willing to pray prayers of lament, like the Psalms. When you read the Psalms, uh, David's saying, God, how long do I have to wait? How long? How long? You see this sense of of transparency and genuineness in Peter. And, And for many of us, honestly, that is something that we don't necessarily advocate in the church. We don't want people to lament before God. And if we were to call people to come up here and you start to hear people lamenting before God, getting angry, just sharing what they truly feel with God, some of you would think they've crossed the boundaries. They've maybe overstepped their boundaries. But what we learn here in this story is that Jesus goes deep with God. And how do we know he goes deep with him? He calls him Abba. Abba translated literally means daddy. Now, for us, that's, we don't really understand the depth of the implication of that. Because for a Jewish rabbi, that was contentious. You don't call God daddy. In fact, in the Old Testament, they couldn't even say the word Yahweh. Because if they did, they would think it's blasphemy. That's why God didn't have a name until Exodus when God says, I am the God of the I am, right? They couldn't even utter the word God. And here we see Jesus Christ at his darkest hour while he's waiting. He opens himself up and he says, Daddy, and he pours out his heart and says, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. He laments before his father. He shows us this depth of intimacy and that prayer should be anything but polite. When you and I are waiting and we're struggling with God. It's but for a short season, I believe, because you shouldn't be doing that all the time. But it's for a short season. But there is not a politeness to your prayers when you are lamenting, brothers and sisters in Christ. You can call God your Abba and establish this deep level of intimacy. My, uh, my daughters, my kids, I do this ritual every day with them when I'm home. Uh, I put them to bed, and they love it when I put them to bed. Christina is uh, 11, and uh, Kayla is 8, and Christian is 6. I got three kids. 
beautiful ages. And uh, they just love when I put them to bed. And so Kayla would always start it off, and she would always call me, you know, they all call me daddy. But she would say, daddy, huggies, huggies. And she, they just, she just wants to get hugged. She's a very affectionate girl. And so I hug her real hard, and, and I hug her so tight, like I suffocate them. And, and my kids love being suffocated, and so I'm <laughs> suffocating them. They're like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And so while I'm doing that, I'm tickling them and everything, and they're just going crazy. They're loving it. And I do that to Christina, and then I do that with Christian, and they are loving it. And there's a sense of intimacy that I have with my children. If Kayla ever started, she's the one that always starts it off, and she says, rather than saying, Daddy, Huggies, and she says, Father, Huggies, I'd freak out. I'd be like, Father? Why are you calling me Father? I'm your daddy, not your father. I hope my kids always call me Daddy, even when they're 50, because I want them to know that no matter what, we share this depth of intimacy, that we can have fun and laugh, but at the moments of their darkest hour, they can come to me. If I disappoint them and fail them as a father, they can come to me and share honestly what they feel towards me. That they are willing and they're open to doing that. And when we look at this passage, we find that Jesus is going to God and he's lamenting and being honest. We see that in the Psalms with David. And we see that lamenting is so key to our prayers while we wait. That God desires that for us. And perhaps maybe for some of you, you're a little bit uncomfortable with the reality of that. And maybe the language of you can lament and you don't have to be sort of proper when you're struggling. Uh, maybe the reason why you're so uh, maybe taken aback by that or you feel a little sense of hesitancy is because it's a reflection of your distance from God. Because if you really had a deep and intimate relationship with him, you can go to him in the depth of what you're feeling and be honest with God. And as you do that, he will come to you and deeply bless you as you lament before him. Why does God want you to lament? Why does he want me to lament in those moments when we struggle in our lives? Yes. But the key reason why is because he wants you to be weak. Weak. He doesn't want you to be strong. He wants you to be weak. And when you see Jesus at this garden, he was utterly weak. He was completely weak. And I love Luke 22 because it says that as Jesus was weak, it says in Luke 22 that the angel came and what did he do? He gave him strength. Why does God want you to be weak? So that his strength can be perfected in your life. And this is why lamenting is so key as you're waiting for God. So waiting isn't a negative thing, but rather what God is hoping is that as you're waiting, that you will begin to lament. And as you begin to lament, you'll become weak. And as you become weak, you experience God's perfect strength in you. That's what God is hoping. And when you do that, you know what you come to realize? You come to realize that you're God's beloved in whom he's well pleased with. You understand your position before God. And that's what Jesus did. Because after this, he's very different. If you read the rest of 14, he's very different because he knows who he is. He knows that, yes, he's going to have to die. And he's going to have to go through moments where his disciples betray him with a kiss and abandon him. And Peter would deny him three times. But he also knows that one day he will stand at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He knew that. And no matter what you and I go through, if you can wait and lament and be weak and God can fill you with his strength, you will know who you are before God. And as you wait, it doesn't matter anymore if God answers those prayers. Because you know who you are before God. You know you're God's beloved in whom he is well pleased with. And you can live your life passionately and you can know that there, there will come a day. And I love the worship leader. She's like, I can't wait to go to heaven. There will come a day where you and I will stand before God and we will be in a place where there will be no more tears. No more waiting. There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow. And that is a world that you and I need to start looking forward to more and more in our lives. You are God's beloved. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are God's beloved. If you don't know that you're God's beloved you're going to struggle with one of the greatest temptations that you and I struggle with in life. You know what it is? Your faith will just become a religion. See, what's the difference between religion and gospel? You know what all religion teaches on a fundamental principle? They all, they all bank on this one principle. They teach you that you must obey in order for you to be accepted. That's what all religion teaches. What's the gospel teach us? 
It teaches that you've already been accepted, and that's why you obey. That's what the gospel teaches us, that you've already been accepted. You are a child of God. You are God's beloved in whom he is well pleased with. And that's why you obey out of the reality of that position that Jesus Christ has given to you. And I love the disciples here because in this story, you find that they're following Jesus on a very religious level. They're thinking that the more they do for God and perhaps if they obey, Peter says, even if I have to die, I will never die for you. I I will never betray you. I will die for you. That's what Peter says, doesn't he? Again, he's following God on a very religious level. I will obey you so that you'll accept me and maybe perhaps you'll give me more blessings as I do that. You see, that's religion. And many of us, we fall into the temptations of that because honestly, you want to obey, don't you? You want to live in true obedience, but you do that because you hope that as you do, that perhaps God will bless you more, right? And that's a, I guess that could be a good thing, but what happens when you don't obey God? Then what do you think? You think then God's coming out to get you. If you think something bad happens in your life, you typically think, did I disobey God in some way? Oh, man, I should not have done that. No. You are God's beloved, not because you didn't masturbate yesterday. You're God's beloved because Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. That's what makes you God's beloved. You're God's beloved, not because you didn't lie or cheat, but you're God's beloved because Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago and entered into human history and died for you and for me on the cross. You are God's beloved, not because you're an elder in this church or you're a pastor or you hold a position in this church. You are God's beloved because Jesus Christ loved you so much that he came and died for you on the cross. Do you see, this helps us and it frees us to realize that no matter what we do, we can never boast, first and foremost, because we've been accepted by God and that's why we obey. But the second thing that it helps us to do is this, that no matter how hard you and I fall, we can't beat ourselves over the head over it because you were brought with a price. You can't treat yourself the way you treat yourself. Jesus Christ cared for you and died for you. How dare we sometimes abuse ourselves This is not our bodies anymore. This is God. It was brought with a price. And we can never beat ourselves up. And it frees you from that. You see, religion teaches us that you have to obey in order for you to be accepted. But the gospel teaches us about what grace is. You've been accepted. And that's why you obey. And this is why I love when you look at Acts and you see Peter and the other apostles. They're very different, aren't they? In fact, they don't mind. And Peter dies and he gets crucified upside down on the cross. But I love in Acts because they bring him aside. The Sanhedrin council brings him and said, stop talking about Jesus. And Peter says, you know what? You can kill me. You can do whatever you want. I'm not going to stop. Why? Because I know Jesus accepts me no matter what. And because of that, I will be faithful in obeying his name. What's the proof of that? Look at verse 28. I love this. Verse 28, Jesus says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He says to the disciples, when I rise from the dead, we're going to rendezvous in Galilee. He knows they're going to betray him. He knows they're going to be all scattered. He knows that they will fall. But Jesus still says, but when I rise from the dead, let's meet in Galilee. I've accepted you no matter what. You can betray me, but I'll still accept you. That is my furious and radical love for you. And I love 51. You ever look at verse 51, you're like, what the heck is this? Like, who is this young man wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus, and then they seized him, and then he ran away butt naked? Who is this guy? Because it almost seems very random that he's here in verse 51. Some scholars say that that's Mark, the writer of this book, that he wanted to prove that he was an eyewitness. Some some other scholars will say that it perhaps is uh, a foreshadowing, a representation of what would happen to Jesus because Jesus was crucified naked on the cross and this man was naked as he ran away. But you know who this man is in verse 51? It's you and me. Because every single one of you would betray Jesus as well. None of us in this room is above the disciples. None of us are above them. We would have ran away. We would not have stayed at the scene. We would not have fought and supported Jesus, we would have all ran away. And what we learn is that even though in our disobedience, even though when we fall, Jesus still says, I'll meet you in Galilee. I'll meet you in Galilee. And so today, are you, lo- are you in a place where you feel like you're waiting and you're struggling right now because you really need God to come through in some things in your life today? 
my hope and my prayer for you is that as you wait, you would be very open to lamenting before God because as you do that, you will be weak and God's strength will be perfected in you. When you do that, you will know who you are before God. You are his beloved in whom he is well pleased with. And you will begin to live your life in such freedom, in such a way where you no longer will just obey God so you think that he'll accept you then, but you'll know deeply in your heart that as you live for God, you know that he accepts you and that's why you obey him radically because of that truth. Uh, so some of you know a little bit. I mean, I came here last year. I'll share with you a little bit about my life. Alex knows a lot about my life. And, you know, honestly, I would say uh, uh, this man, uh, your pastor, is um, one of my closest friends, but really a, a real deep mentor. Uh, he has helped me to be a, a much better father today. And my kids are much better off today because of my friendship with him. And I tell them, I was like, you can help me to be a better pastor or leader, but that to me is not as important as helping me to be a better father. And he came last weekend and spent a few days with our church fathers. About 33 of them came out, and uh, their lives were so deeply impacted because I believe that he has such a, a, a voice. He's literally a megaphone for God uh, in talking about this amazing issue that all men need to learn and, 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 uh, and grow in and being a better father. Uh, I didn't have a very good example growing up because my dad wasn't a very good father. Uh, my father was um, a pretty abusive man. Uh, growing up, he wasn't just abusive to the kids, but he was really abusive to my mother. And that really created a very dark complex within me um, because I realized after years of just processing this, even with Alex, I realized that my greatest fear, because I, I was a very fearful child and even fearful person today. It's one of the things I struggle with. And, uh, and I realized that uh, sort of the genesis of my fear always came, not because I was afraid that dad would hit me, but I was afraid that dad would hit mom or that dad would kill mom. And so I grew up with that reality, and I struggled with that. My father became my, a very intimate stranger in my own home, and uh, we didn't get along very well. Uh, when I was in college, my sister, I found out from my sister that my father had uh, sexually abused her. And when I found that out, uh, I went downstairs. It was late at night. I, I was determined to take his life because I just felt like this guy did nothing to benefit this family. All he did was hurt it. And so I was about eight steps away from taking his life with a knife while he was sleeping. And I was so broken at that moment, and I th said to God, and of course, I didn't go through with it. But I said, why would you give a dad like this to us? And so because of that, there was a lot of issues that I struggled with in life growing up as well. And when I was in college, when I was in high school, before I went to college, I felt a very deep longing from God to go into ministry. And uh, I accepted it. I said, I'll do it, God. I'll be a pastor. But then when I went to college... I convinced myself out of it, and uh, I convinced myself out of it, not because I didn't want to be a pastor, but I just felt like I wasn't pastor material. You guys know what I'm talking about? Because I felt like pastors shouldn't be struggling with all these sins that I struggle with. I can't get away from these things. It's very hard on myself. I was very religious back then, right? And I struggled with that, and, uh, and I struggled with just a lot of different things in my own life. And the other thing was I know pastors like to read and study. I hated that. I hated reading. I hated studying, you know. And pastors should be good orators. They, they're very good at communicating, and, and I'm an introvert, and so I'm not very good. That was, public speaking was always bad. I got like a D in communications in college, right, because I get so scared when I stand in front of people. And so uh, it, it was a struggle of mine. So I said, nah, nah, you know what, I'm just going to work in the marketplace, do the best I can, and just, you know, work in the church, serve in the church to the best of my ability. And then in 1997, I attended this conference, and there was a pastor there, his name was Bob O. He's from uh, uh, L.A., and he started a church, a church planning movement in L.A. called Oikos, which means house in Greek. And he came up and he shared this story about his own life, about how when he was a kid, God had called him to be a pastor, but then he dodged it and he forgot about it. And I remember as he was sharing this, I literally felt the Holy Spirit come upon me, and he started to convict me, and I thought, no, 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 you can't. And at the end of his sermon, he says, I believe there's somebody in this room where God is calling to full-time ministry. And if that's you, you've got to get up and come to the altar. And I remember holding on to my pew, and I literally said, no, God, you can't make me get up there. I am not going to do it. I cannot do it. And I held on to the pew as hard as I could. But literally what I felt was the Holy Spirit lift me up. He brought me to the front of the altar, and I knelt before him, and I just wailed. I said, God, why? Why, why would you want me to do this? You know how messed up I am. You know how much I sin. You know I struggle in my own life. 
why? Why would you want me? I don't have anything to offer you. Why would you want me to do this? And in that moment, God said, the reason why is because that's why. Because in your weakness, my strength will be perfected in you. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, from that moment on, it's been ups and downs, I tell you what. Planning Metro eight years ago, traveling around the world and seeing what God is doing, being here in this amazing church, worshiping with you, I realize more and more how important it is for us to get to a place where we can be weak so that God's strength can be perfected in us. And that's why he makes you wait. He makes you wait because he wants his strength to be at full capacity in your life today. And so my challenge for you is this. Will you lament if you feel like you're struggling today? Will you have a time in your life right now, maybe even now, that you'd be willing to come to the altar and just lament before God? And as you empty yourself, may the angel of the Lord come upon you. And you sang that song so beautifully, choir, about the angel. And may he fill you up with his strength. And may you know that you are truly God's beloved in whom he is well pleased with. And as you do that, may God open doors and do things in your life that you never thought he could imagine. So can we bow our heads for a moment of prayer? I want to just give you a brief moment to spend some time with God, to connect with him. And maybe you might feel a little off doing this, but if you feel like you need to lament, I want to encourage you to do that. If you want to come up to the altar, come up to the altar. And on your knees,